Welcome back to Dead Good Book Reviews. I'm Judith and you're watching another book review here on the channel. I think hopefully this is an anticipated book review if you've been watching for a while, but today we're going to be talking about The Founders Trilogy by Robert Jackson Bennett. You may be wondering, I've held up my copy of the second book Shawfall before, um, I don't know where it is. That's between, between the book and, and the universe at the moment. It's somewhere within these four walls. Some quick disclaimers before we start. Um, I was sent review copies of, I think, just book three of this series. I'm pretty sure Foundryside and Shawfall I read just from books that I owned, but I did have a review copy of Locklands, regardless of where books are coming from. Nobody's paying me to talk about books and all opinions are my own. I'm also gonna keep this as spoiler-free as humanly possible, but I am gonna need to talk about how the story ends in a very broad sense. So if you want to go in knowing absolutely nothing, click away now, but you're not gonna have the series ruined for you. At least I'm gonna do my best. But I feel like otherwise you're just reviewing book one and like, what's the point? And as ever, I will link the story graph for the book below in case you wanna check out any content warnings or indeed mark it as reading on Storygraph. The Founders Trilogy started in 2018 when the first book, Foundry Side, was released. At least that's when it released in the UK. Uh, it was followed by Shawfall, the second book, I'll put the cover up, and then finally by Locklands, which came out roughly last week, if you're watching this when this video comes out. I'm a big fan of the UK covers, but the US covers do look something like this, if you would like to look at those as well. Robert Jackson Bennett is an author who's also written stuff like City of Stairs. I've not read them, but if you have, feel free to weigh in in the comments whether you like them or not. And yeah, I'd describe this as sort of, in my opinion, um, a fantasy city-based book that leans a little bit into sort of steampunk-esque regions. It's not a steampunk book, but it's 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 brushing up against those things. So book one, Foundryside, starts with our main character, Sanchia, who is a petty thief, as we will know. That is one of my favourite things. Uh, and she is on a mission to steal something for the person that she steals things for. Uh, and we sort of open the book with this big epic heist scenario of her trying to get to a place to steal a thing. She manages to steal that thing. But as it often goes with this kind of story, stealing that thing opens up boxes that I don't think Sanchia was ever really expecting, and everything sort of starts to both collapse and build up from there. It's a classic snowballing of events from page one kind of story. And as the book series goes on, the stakes get higher, everything gets a bit more intense, and the magic gets even more fun to play with, because I think what will actually sell this book for you, if you are a reader like me, is indeed the magic system. So, in this world we have scriving, which is basically a system where you can take some metal, write some stuff on it, and affix it to an object, and it will convince that object that the thing is happening. And the best example I can have of this is scribed kind of crossbow bolts, and the idea is that the bolt is being told by the scribing that it is actually not going forward in a straight line, it is going down and is reaching terminal velocity, and that means that it can fire really, really fast forward. You can also scribe carriage wheels to feel like they're constantly rolling downhill in order to make them move. But in order to have scribing work, you have to have these big lexicons, which kind of like simplify some of the scribing meanings and so such, and it's sort of like almost figuring out a programming language. Uh, and this whole world runs on it, and you can use it for very, very good things, and you can also use it for sneaky, sneaky thief things. And that is something we find out across these books. I would say if that magic system sounds interesting to you, this book delivers on that. There are some books where they'll start off with a really cool, really intricate magic system, and you're like, yes, I'm here for this, tell me the rules, show me how to break them, show me all the cool things you can do, and then it'll be like halfway through and it'll just go, ooh, but that's a dreamy fairy prince, let me go after him, and you're like, no, give me more of the magic system. Rob Jackson Bennett delivers on the magic. If we're looking at the magic across the series as a whole, I actually think book one is my favourite for it, because you get the explanation of how it works, and you just start to kind of play with the idea of it, but I did really enjoy how the different ways that the scribing system is used, and the different ways it could be messed around with, and broken, and used against the people who are trying to use it, and so such, escalate throughout the three books, and that's a trend we'll really see in this series. If we're talking about characters, Sanchia is an obvious one. I really, really like Sanchia as a character. I think that she fits all of the good moulds of this plucky thief with a dark backstory who sort of almost has a heart of gold. I think one of the things I enjoyed is that we do get to know that backstory in Sanchia as a character, but she's very in the now as a person, and I think that that helps it not feel super bogged down and helps her feel like she is focused on the problem at hand. And I think often when characters have this backstory, they can get very stuck in that. And then when, you know, the world is ending in the modern day, you're like, why are we thinking about this? There are more important things. And Sanchia is a character who I think 
can focus on the more important things, which I really enjoyed. But there is a whole host of other characters around her. We have uh, the romantic interest, which Sapphics among us will be pleased to know is Sapphic. Hooray, yay, let's cheer for that. We have kind of mentor characters, we have other people with lots of tragic backstories. It is sort of in the by the end of book one you're in sort of a found family place i don't think it stays there which is another reason why book one is my favorite but we do get more characters introduced and they they play with the dynamics of those characters quite a lot i think for me personally the character relationships are strongest in book one uh, and they get developed a little bit more in book two for some of the other relationships that are going on and by book three that isn't the most important focus of the book. Book three is very, very plot based. That's not a bad thing by any means, but obviously if you are reading the series for the trajectory of characters who are not the main one or two characters, you might be a bit disappointed by the end because they don't feature as much. But I think that they are well-crafted characters and as I say, found family, I'm a sucker for it, so book one really hits home for me. There is a good strong element of eat the rich in these books. I don't think that should come as a surprise when we have this world where the people who have access to lots of scribing tools and live in these merchant houses have all of the money and everyone else is kind of struggling. And I think that the book does a really good job of bringing in characters who are wealthy into these situations and not being like oh my goodness poverty is a thing I never would have known I've changed my heart which is always a little bit a little bit a little bit iffy um but it's more um a gradual change and more a realization and then actually trying to combat that which is always nice I think again by the end of the series there are more things at stake than that but it is a through line of kind of this disparity in access to the thing that's making the world work at the moment and whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. So yeah, if you're here for an Eat the Rich plotline, this is another one for you. I mentioned that escalation in threat um, as we go through the books. The, the big bad that they are facing definitely does increase. But what I like about it is that the way of dealing with that doesn't change. These are, I feel, at their core, heist books in that each one has uh, either one or multiple big things that they need to crack uh, and it takes all of our gadgets and all of our skills and all of our different uh, means combined in order to really tackle this and that goes from being somewhat small scale maybe at book one to very very large scale by book three and that threat has escalated but the means of dealing with it hasn't and I think that's one of the things that makes this series work is that through line of how are they going to solve this problem. Overall I loved every single book in this series which doesn't happen very often for me especially for a trilogy I think because of each one having quite a distinct problem to deal with um, and also all of them being quite similar in length I think I haven't actually looked at a copy of Locklands. That being said I love Foundry Side so much it is such a good book it hits so many of the marks that are there for me personally so the found family the heist, the plucky thief, the backstory, all of that stuff, that it meant that I didn't love Shawfall and Locklands as much. They were 4.75 rather than fives because I knew I loved Foundryside so much. So maybe it depends what you're interested in and what you like about this. My personal preference was for the almost lower stakes but still quite high stakes but lower stakes of book one um that doesn't mean i was disappointed in what happened in two and three it's just where where the balance lies so be aware of that going in if you really fall for a particular aspect of the book that isn't scribing as the magic system it might not flow through into book three overall i had such a wonderful time with the series it is one of my all-time favorite series i think i can safely say that i would read short stories i would read novellas in this world but honestly the trilogy is just just perfection maybe maybe i didn't love the very very ending but i can stand by it and there have been very few occasions where i've been like oh i totally want that exact ending of my big intricate trilogy with a lot of different moving parts right how when does that happen so if you're wondering whether or not you should read this series my my gut instinct is absolutely yes 1000 percent if it's something that even sounds vaguely interesting to you pick it up now i waited such a ridiculously long time to start it and then a long time again to actually read book two and then I read book three very quickly so I would just say pick them up pick them up do it it's a great time and if you were wondering if you need to do a reread I think it helps just because it gives you that flow of the story and the emotional arc of a trilogy I think with third books it's almost more important to do that for that arc um I don't think it's absolutely necessary because there is and this is like a minor not a spoiler just a piece of information there is a time jump between books two and three so it does necessitate a little bit of explanation about where we are and how we got there but I think just for that emotional connection, you do need a little bit, a little bit more knowledge of what happened in the previous book. So this was one of those series where book one was absolutely the standout selling point for me, but books two and three really, really stood up. That hasn't happened very often lately. We've had a lot of kind of like 
downhill trilogies recently. I don't know why that has been, it just has been. So I'm really pleased to have had one that I really really enjoyed and I'm very excited for my copy of Lockplans to come. I need to actually order one. I need to do a bookshop order, that's what I need to do. Maybe I'll do that this afternoon as a reward for filming a lot of videos. Yeah, if you see a lot of videos of me in this ghost shirt, that's why. Have you read these? Do you have plans to? Have you been excitedly waiting for Locklands? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. While you're there commenting, if you haven't already, please do subscribe. It makes me feel loved and appreciated, though nothing makes me feel more loved and appreciated than my patrons over on Patreon who support the channel, get videos like this early and bonus content and exclusive content and all of that jazz. If you'd like to join their number, that's linked below, as is my social media and my Discord if you want to come have chill chats about books. Thank you so much for watching, that's all from me and I will see you in the next one. It's done a piece of bloopers now. Welcome back to Dead- oh I didn't clap, I didn't clap. There's no intro music, I don't know why I'm doing the intro music dance.